Hello, it's Scott Manley here. It's October 1st. It's time for another batch of Deep Space updates. And this is quite a big one because I had to do a whole bunch of traveling for various family related reasons. But yeah, uh, we go back in time to the 12th of September. Yeah, three weeks ago, we had a Falcon 9 launching 21 Starlink satellites into a group. 7-2, which means that that came from Vandenberg and it did not well. I was not in town, so I was very disappointed to miss that. 15th of September, there was another launch from Vandenberg. Yes, Firefly Alpha with their Victus Knox launch. Remember, this was their uh, ra tactically responsive space program thing where the DoD would say, hey, we need you to launch in 24 hours, and they did. So Firefly Alpha successfully launching from Vandenberg uh, at very short notice. And incidentally, if you're interested in Firefly's uh, engines or the Reaver engines, the slow-mo guys did a thing where they uh, you know, visited and they watched the rocket engine ignition and it looks absolutely beautiful. I highly recommend watching that. But congratulations to Firefly for succeeding in that mission. 15th of September, we also saw a launch of Soyuz MS-24. This is the first time that Russia has launched people to the space station in a year. Because if you remember, MS-22 sprung a leak on orbit. And so MS-23 was sent up on, uh, without any crew on board. So the crew on board is uh, Oleg Kononenko, Nikolai Chubb and uh, Laurel O'Hara. They've docked at the space station, and that, of course, enabled uh, MS-22 crew to come home, but we'll talk about that in a minute. 16th of September, there was another batch of Starlink satellites launched from Florida. Normally, I would just skim over this because there's so many, except this one stands out from the crowd by having an absolutely amazing deployment video showing a camera on top of the second stage as the satellites drift away, and you can see all sorts of cool details in the reflections from those satellites. I rewatched this video dozens of times. 17th was a uh, Long March 2D launching three Yaogan uh, reconnaissance satellites for Chinese military out of Chichang. 19th of September, we have an Electron launching out of Mahia. The mission was We Will Never Desert You. It was carrying the second of four payloads for uh, Capella Space. These are synthetic aperture radar satellites. And Unfortunately, the second stage engine seems to have deserted this world. Uh, it failed soon after ignition, like almost instantaneous. It's not clear that there was any propulsion at all. There were sparks seen above the engine bell, which is unusual. We don't know what happened, but it looked uh, catastrophic enough that it took out the camera, or at least deprived it of uh, the ability to send data back. So we'll follow up on that when we actually get some real data. 20th of September saw another Starlink launch out of Cape Canaveral carrying 22 Starlink satellites. This would not be notable except for the fact that it was carried by booster number 1058, which was on its 17th flight, setting a new record. 21st of September, a Galactic Energy launched their uh, Series 1 carrying a uh, Jillian Gaufen 4B. It was called a mission designated Autumn Sonata. And this was the first time their rocket failed. It looked like it failed during the first stage. There's a flash of orange smoke, uh, some inconsistency, and then debris is seen. We don't have very much information on this, but uh, yeah, this was an otherwise previously a reliable launch vehicle. First time it has failed. 24th of September, Falcon 9 launching 22 Starlink satellites from Cape Canaveral. 25th of September, there was a Falcon 9 launching 21 Starlink satellites out of Vandenberg. 26th of September, over in China, we have a Long March 4C launching Yaogan Earth observation satellites into Sun Synchronous orbits. And on the 27th of September, we have one out of left field. We have Iran launching their Cassette their rocket carrying a newer reconnaissance satellite, which is reportedly 2.5 times better resolution than previous newer reconnaissance satellites. This is from the Sharud missile test site. And uh, it's not their civilian program. It's the Ir Iran's Revolutionary Guard rocket program, which has been altogether more successful. So this satellite ended up in a 60 degree orbit at about 450 kilometers. Finally, on September 30th, we had a Falcon 9 carrying 22 Starlink satellites out of Cape Canaveral. Okay, so now let's skip on to the rest of the news. Axiom Space announced the crew for their next flight, Axiom 3, which will be in early 2024 for a couple of weeks. 
So the three passengers that are being paid to fly on this are Marcus Vont, who is a Swedish astronaut. He's a reserve astronaut selected by European Space Program, which means he probably won't fly with a European Space Agency, but Sweden are paying for him to fly to the space station. There is uh, Alper Gerzavacci, uh, that's probably mispronounced, but he's a Turkish astronaut with the Turkish Air Force. And again, same deal. Their government is paying for him to fly. And Walter Vulade, who is an Italian astronaut, and you might know him or you might recognize him because he flew on Virgin Galactic's flight uh, you know, a few couple of months ago. The commander for this mission is, of course, Michael Lopez Alegria, one of the most experienced astronauts. He fle- previously flew Axiom 1. Uh, Stoke Space, they demonstrated the ability to hop their little prototype. Stoke Space are, of course, working on combining a heat shield and a rocket engine into one system so that you can recover a second stage from orbit. I'm very excited that they've demonstrated this work, also that they've demonstrated that their uh, hydrogen engine is working and is controllable at a rate that lets them fly this. Osiris Rex returned its sample to Earth successfully. I was watching this and I was on the edge of my seat as I saw no parachute coming out, but the capsule is down safely. And we've now seen some uh, images from inside the capsule that has been opened. There's a lot of black dust, obviously from the asteroid around here. I think the the way the system is designed, there's room for small particles to escape. And so we haven't seen the larger fragments, but the smaller fragments have been moving all around the interior here. So that's our first look at material from the asteroid Bennu. Meanwhile, the parent spacecraft, OSIRIS-REx, swung by the Earth and is now headed off towards Apophis and has been renamed OSIRIS-APEX. So we're going to have like a proper opening ceremony, I think, where we're actually going to see the macroscopic chunks uh, on October 11th. So pay attention to that. Uh, Even more bigger earth-shattering news is that at Blue Origin, Bob Smith is retiring. He has been running the company for some time now. He announced that he will resign in December and he'll be replaced by David Limp, who is the executive at Amazon, who's been overseeing Project Kuiper. So, uh, yeah, he's going to stand down in December. And honestly, a lot of people uh, have been wondering what takes Blue Origin so long and certainly laying a bunch of blame potentially at his feet. So, Maybe, maybe under new management, we might see more of the ferocitor in Graditim Ferocitor because we've definitely seen a lot of very small steps. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not really clear if this will accelerate things given how far they are down the road towards launching um, you know, new Glenn. But New Shepard, on the other hand, the FAA officially have closed the investigation on that. They accepted the analysis from Blue Origin that the engine was running hotter than expected that led to structural failure in the nozzle. They've identified about 21 corrective actions that Blue Origin will have to take before they fly again. And These haven't been itemized, so we don't know exactly what they are. We don't know how far down the road that Blue Origin are towards uh, getting back to flight. But it has been over a year since this incident, and but hopefully we get to see them flying sooner rather than later. Also, on the Blue Origin front, I, I was funny while uh, while I was out traveling. My wife was like, hey, we're going to watch a TV show. It's going to be called The Morning Show and there are no rockets in it, Scott. But I'm going to make you watch it. Fine. First episode, rocket in it. That looks an awful lot like New Shepard. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Um, so, so, yeah, as I said, Soyuz MS-24 got to the space station delivering new astronauts. Uh, That meant that Soyuz MS-22 could return. So that was Sergei Prokopiev, Dmitry Petalin, and Frank Rubio. And because this was unexpected, right? Remember, the spacecraft had a a problem with its cooling system back in December. They sent up a replacement, but basically extended the mission. And that meant that uh, this was the third longest time spent on orbit for any person like there's a couple of previous cosmonauts that spent more time in space on a single flight on Mir but uh, for this case Frank Rubio is now the NASA astronaut with the longest single space flight so 371 days that of course returned uh, to Kazakhstan and by the way Kazakhstan may be getting on board with international sanctions regarding uh, 
Russia and their uh, invasion of Ukraine. So it'll be interesting to see what happens going forward with uh, you know, Baikonur and Kazakhstan at this point. Um, elsewhere, Psyche. Psyche is getting ready for launch. We're so close. It was going to launch on October 5th, but they've pushed that back to October 12th because they have some concerns about adjusting the hog, the cold gas thrusters that will be used for attitude control. So they're tweaking that. They still have plenty of time in the window. They've got at least two weeks starting October 12th. There will be instantaneous launch windows every day. The first one is at 10, 16 a.m. Uh, and when it launches, yeah, it's going to head off to Asteroid Psyche. Because the launch was delayed by a whole year, they've now got to take a new trajectory. And the new trajectory can't take as advantage of uh, the same, you know, gravity assist opportunities. So it's actually going to take two years longer. So it's only going to get there in 2029. But I'm here for it. Falcon 9 is stood up at the Cape. We've had an engine test. Uh, it looks great. 27 engines all firing at once. You know, Nice used cores on the side. The center core is stripped down. No landing legs. It's going to be expended in a glorious launch to Psyche. It will be... You know what? I'm going to say it. This is going to be the most metal rocket launch from SpaceX yet. And also NASA has agreed that it will extend the New Horizons mission, allowing it to continue doing Kuiper Belt research in addition to heliophysics. There was some concern that NASA would pair back its mission to stop it doing any research on the Kuiper Belt while it was inside the Kuiper Belt. Uh, so that's not going to happen. They're going to have the scientists on board if a target presents itself. Now, it's not clear that they will be able to make another target because there's none known along its current trajectory. It's very hard to find Kuiper Belt objects and get their trajectories down with enough precision. Maybe James Webb Space Telescope might help on that front, but it's doing a lot of other cool things like looking at the surface of Europa and finding carbon dioxide. Nevertheless, they're going to get full support right through 2029 uh, when it will be uh, you really starting to leave the solar system. And it's also talking about extended missions. Ingenuity, the mission that was only supposed to fly three times, has now passed 60 flights on Mars. Good going. There's been amazing images coming out of Sierra Nevada space with a dream chaser getting increasingly uh, towards completion, getting the you know various control surfaces and heat shields and stuff attacked. Take a look at some of that stuff. It's great. Uh, China officially have announced that they are going to be flying Chang'e, six to the far side of the moon to collect a sample from the surface there. So uh, it sounds like they're going to launch in May of 2024 and the target will be the South Pole Aiken Basin. That'll be like uh, 43 degrees south, 154 west. Now to get signals to the far side of the moon, they're going to need to use a relay satellite. Currently they have the Kikau-1, or I think that's how you, maybe it's Chichao. <laughs> I think... I, I get this, like the Q doesn't sound like that in Chinese, so I keep getting told. Anyway, uh, there is a, a Chi Chao 2, and <laughs> I'm second guessing myself. <laughs> I'm seeing all those comments in my head, and I'm trying to get this pronunciation good. Um, so I'm presuming that they're going to launch the second relay satellite before this mission, but uh, I'm still not clear if that's going to be a ride along. Also on the moon, when the sun rose over the landing site of uh, Vikram and, and uh, Chandrayaan three, there was a. Uh, they've been trying to contact the probe, see if it will wake up, but there have been no signals received. So it looks like indeed the uh, Chandrayaan three, or sorry, Vikram have not survived the night on the lunar surface, which is unfortunate. iSpace Technologies also have unveiled a new lunar lander design. If you remember, they managed to crash their lander into the surface of the moon earlier this year. Well, they've got a new one. It's going to be bigger. Apex 1.0 It's something like 10 times the payload capacity. Um, part of the problem was that they were selected for the Clips the Commercial Lunar Payload Services mission with a, a Draper team providing a payload. And the spacecraft that they were building wasn't up to the task, so they've gone through a major redesign, which has really enhanced the capabilities. But that does mean that because they've got to make such big changes to the design, they're not going to be launching until like 2026. Uh, also, question about when it's going to launch a Starship. 
still sitting around in Boca Chica. Uh, the lodge license is not there because after the, well, um, effects upon the environment due to the flight test, one, the fisheries and wildlife services are, are still having to compile a report, uh, analysis, approval. It's not really clear how much power they have here, but they are definitely involved because they got involved after rocks were thrown into what they were involved with. Yeah, they need to complete this review before they get uh, before a launch license can be issued. It could be in October, but there's no guarantees. Uh, just yesterday, there was a chance that the U.S. government was going to be shut down over political wranglings over spending slash you know taxes not being collected, and um, that has been that would have stopped the Fisheries and Wildlife Services doing anything. So I guess that's good for SpaceX that that government shutdown didn't happen. Incidentally, if a shutdown did happen, the Psyche launch would have been considered uh, exempt from it because it pretty much relies on a launch window, which was not going to change no matter how much political wrangling was going on in Washington. You know, you can argue about laws all you like, but the laws of physics, they are, <laughs> they can be argued or reasoned with. Anyway, uh, yeah, there's been a lot of activity there. I mean, okay, there's always a lot of activity there. With they demolished one of the old buildings, they were standing up a new one in its place to make them more room. They uh, unstacked the booster, they took the hot staging ring off, and they restacked the booster. They did a test over at the Massey test site, including completely destroying one of the tanks in a pressure test. So, yeah, maybe we'll see a launch in the next uh, months. Maybe not, but I do know that on October 14th, there is going to be an annular solar eclipse visible in North America. So that's going to be the last annular solar eclipse if you're in the right place for a quite a long time. So, you know, if you happen to have an opportunity, it's a cool thing to see. It's not a total solar eclipse, but it's still pretty damn cool. And with that, I'm going to bid you farewell. I'll be back in a couple of weeks with another batch of Deep Space updates. But until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. And I didn't turn on the light. Again. Scott. You f***ing idiot. <laughs>